Good morning, everyone. If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 14. 1 Chronicles chapter 14. And let us go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this continuing time together with this body of believers, Lord, as we seek to become more mature as your disciples, Lord, through the study of your word so that we can be better witnesses to the world outside, Lord, and better brothers and sisters one to another. Lord, and so we can serve you better in all that we do. So please help us now, Lord, as we study this. Let your Holy Spirit take it and um, use it in our lives, Lord, to help us grow in your truth, that you might be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so last week we read the Chronicler's report of David gathering all of Israel together in order to bring the Ark of the Covenant to their new capital city, Jerusalem. And we saw how they failed in that attempt, They're trying to cut some corners, like using a cart to carry the Ark, and Uzzah breaking the law and touching the Ark for which he died. Now in our study today, we're going to leave the journey of the Ark, cover some other things that occurred during this period of David's life. Then, as Dr. Bailey pointed out last week, we will return to the story of the Ark in chapters 15 and 16. Now, as you know, throughout this study, we've been referring back to the records of these events in the books of 1 and 2 Samuel, which would have been one of the records used by the chronicler in compiling his books during the post-exilic period. However, we know from what we've read that the Chronicler also had other records that he consulted, and that accounts for some of the variations we have seen. I point this out because these events we've been studying recently are not all given in the same chronological order as we see in 1 and 2 Samuel. Let me show you what I mean. Both accounts start out with David capturing Jerusalem and making it the capital of Israel. But then Samuel goes to Hiram of Tyre, building David's house, whereas the chronicler goes to David's attempt to bring the ark to Jerusalem. Samuel then moves on to David marrying more wives, while the chronicler now has Hiram of Tyre building David's house. Samuel then has David fighting with the Philistines, while the chronicler has David marrying more wives. Samuel then has David attempting to bring the ark into Jerusalem while the chronicler has David fighting the Philistines. But finally, both have David succeeded in bringing the ark into Jerusalem. So we do have a difference between the two writers on when these events took place, in which order. But being that the writing of 1 and 2 Samuel is given as, as being much closer to the actual events, actually is by as much as five centuries closer, I think Samuel may have the correct order. But either way, today we're studying 1 Chronicles and we'll see the Chronicler's report on some of these events, which I've outlined as follows. Verses 1 and 2 are Hiram of Tyre building David's house. Verses 3 through 7 is David gaining additional wives and children. Verses 8 through 12 David's first battle with the Philistines, and verses 13 through 17, David's second battle with the Philistines. So with that in mind, let's begin our study of 1 Chronicles chapter 14 by reading verses 1 and 2. I will be reading from the New King James Version. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees with masons and carpenters to build him a house. So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, for his kingdom was highly exalted for the sake of his people Israel. Natire was the lead city in the kingdom of Phoenicia in that period. From this map, you can see that Phoenicia ran up along the coastline, which today is the nation of Lebanon, which is known for its cedar trees. In fact, the flag of Lebanon recognizes this fact by putting a cedar tree prominently in the middle. Well, it was also famous for its cedar trees thousands of years ago when Hiram was a king of Tyre. 
I gather that his was a friendly nation at that time, since it was known for its maritime skills and its trees, meaning that they specialized in commerce and building supplies, which is probably why Hiram sent messengers to David. He knew that David and the Israelites had conquered the Jebusites and had taken over Jerusalem. And it was well known during that period of time in the Middle East that a new king was authenticated by having his own royal palace. So Hiram not only sent David the cedar trees with which to build his palace, he also sent him the masons and carpenters to do the work. So you might think of Tyre as being the first Home Depot, not only providing the supplies, but also the expertise to get the work done. This recognition of the skilled craftsmen of Tyre is made by David's son Solomon in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, where he says this, Therefore, send me at once a man skillful to work <coughs> pardon me, in gold and silver, in bronze and iron, in purple and crimson and blue, who has skill to engrave with the skillful men who are with me in Judah and Jerusalem, whom David my father provided. Also send me cedar and cypress and alagum logs from Lebanon, for I know that your servants have skill to cut timber in Lebanon. And indeed, my servants will be with your servants." So the Phoenicians were skilled in many things and helped not only David, but also his son Solomon. In verse 2 of our study tells us, So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, for his kingdom was highly exalted for the sake of his people Israel. Well, this evidence provided by the king of Tyre wanting to befriend David and giving him all these building materials and helpers made it clear to David that this was the Lord's doing in establishing him as king over Israel. And we can identify with that. When you're trying to do all that you can to live your life for our Lord's greater glory, in the way you treat others, in the way you do your jobs or raise your kids, don't you like it when somebody says something or something happens that makes it clear that you're indeed serving our Lord? I think we all have instances like that in our lives, and as we see here, King David did as well. King of Tyre sees him as this king, sees his need, and sends all this stuff down. But David, in his humility, did not take credit to himself. He didn't say, well, I conquered the Jebusites, I took the city, and of course they want to come down and be my friend. He knew that his kingdom was being highly exalted. The Hebrew actually says, lifted upwards. He, because he knew that God had given the surrounding nations the desire to give Israel great respect. And he did this for their sake, not to give David an ego trip. David knew this. He respected God's working on behalf of Israel. This is an important point to know about King David. I mean, how would you feel if you were made head of something? Just a group or an area, city, kingdom. And the neighboring leader came to you with supplies and workers to help you build something big for you to live in, some palace or something. Something like that might make anybody a bit egotistical, but not David. However, since there was a peace, since there was a period right now that appears to be going on right now of peace in the land, we're going to get to some battles in a little bit. Right now, it appears that there's a period of peace. That David had this building project underway. His house, and, and as we'll see in the next chapter, uh, a tabernacle, preparing a tabernacle uh, for the ark. Uh, he also decided, apparently, that it was a good time to take more wives. Verse 3 tells us, Then David took more wives in Jerusalem, and David begot more sons and daughters. And these are the names of his children whom he had in Jerusalem. Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, Elpelet, Noga, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, Valedia, and Eliphalet. Remember <laughs> that last name, Eliphalet. We'll come back to them. Now, we know that just as having a royal palace made you 
authenticated you as a king. Another symbol of Oriental regal privilege back in that time was for a king to build up a harem and also have concubines. Now, we know that God does not prohibit polygamy in the Bible in general. However, he did prohibit it in regard to the kings of Israel, according to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17, which tells us this about God's plans for the kings of Israel. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. You remember there's another verse that says he shall not multiply horses to himself. Now some have said this is a prohibition against polygamy, period. Well, if you have that, then we can't have gold and we can't have horses. I mean, if, I mean you can't cherry pick. Things, things out of this. this. This verse is very specific in God giving, talking about his plans for the kings of Israel. So it appears that David, as, we were, as Dr. Cook was talking earlier about, you know, like the, the thing going on with Simon, Simon getting saved but still having to grow in his faith, things like that. And we saw that David had an affair with Bathsheba, that, that David had some things that he had to deal with in this area because he's a sinner saved by grace like the rest of us. And so it appears here that David gave in to some pagan oriental potentate behavior here. But God used it to produce David's son Solomon, which would build the temple and continue a kingly line for a while. Unfortunately, Solomon would also be the poster boy for this passage from Deuteronomy because of all the wives that he took in which we, we see a, the problem generated, which was the problem of polygamy with the kings of Israel, which is why the Lord outlawed it. Because many of the wives would turn out to, would be pagans. They would be married for other reasons, for unity between countries or things like that. And they would turn the king away from Yahweh to their pagan gods, and then God would bring judgment, as we saw happen. Now, while, well, as I said, the Bible does not prohibit polygamy in general, it does give us many examples to show the many problems that exist in such relationships. Because God's design is for one man to marry one woman, period. We don't see David being judged here by God for this behavior, which doesn't mean that God condoned it. Just because he didn't show his judgment here on, on David doesn't mean he condoned it. Just that he didn't make the record of holding David responsible for all of his sins privy to us. He, he told us about the sins that he wanted to show us that, that David was being judged for at the time. And as we see in Scripture, God did use David's sinful practices for his own purposes. As for the children named here, this list differs from that given in 2 Samuel chapter 5 by adding two names, Elipat and Noga. These two children are also listed in the family of David, given in 1 Chronicles chapter 3. But in that listing, El Elpalet is spelled Eliphalet, like the son that we saw at the end of the last list, the list we went through earlier. So David then either had two sons with the same name, or one of these records is misspelled. Now, we aren't given a strict chronological time stamp as to when the peace with the Philistines ended, especially in relationship to David getting married multiple times and preparing a home for the Ark of the Covenant. But we do know that it was not long after he became king. Let's see how that first battle with the Philistines went and read verses 8 through 12. Now, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went out against them. Then the Philistines went and made a raid on the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? The Lord said to him, Go up, for I will deliver them into your hand. So they went up to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. Then David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand like a breakthrough of water. Therefore they called the name of that place Baal Perazim. 
And when they left their gods there, David gave a commandment and they were burned with fire. Okay, let's go back to verse 8 and notice the use of the word all. First, we see that the Philistines heard that David was anointed king over all Israel. Once again, we see the chronicler emphasizing to the post-exilic Jews that all of Israel, all 12 tribes still existed and were present in their numbers. But now we have a second usage of the word all. We see that all of the Philistines went out to find David, presumably to kill the new king and then exercise dominance over Israel. Remember what we studied earlier, that David actually hid from King Saul for over a year by being an ally to the Philistine king. But his army commanders, the Philistine army's commanders, would not let David go with them to fight against King Saul for fear that David and his personal army would switch sides and start helping King Saul. So they never really trusted David as an ally, and now he was king of all Israel. So think of this. We're being told that the whole nation of Philistia has come out against King David. It said, all of Philistia. And from our study of chapter 12, we know that David has over 300,000 men who are warriors to fight for him. So this has the potential to be a major war between these two nations. And the first point of attack by the Philistines was here, the Valley of Rephaim, which runs southwest of Jerusalem, as you can see on this slide. I know on this map it's hard to see Jerusalem, so I put a red box around it and a green box around Bethlehem so you can see their relationship to the Valley of Rephaim. So David hears about the raid of the Philistines and immediately gathers his army and goes out to meet them. No, David does not do this. He does not trust in his own skills as a warrior and the skills of his army to deliver the day. David knows why he is king, and he knows who he serves. Verse 10 tells us, And David inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? In a time of great stress, in a time of emotions running high, and people probably saying, do this or do that, David has the presence of mind to step back and to go to the one he can always trust, the one who will never steer him wrong, the one who always answers him truthfully. And David inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? Can we relate to this? What do you do in stressful situations? What do you do when you lose your job? When you lose your house? When your spouse or one of your children gets injured or worse? Who is the first one you turn to? As King David shows us, it should always be our God. He who gives us every heartbeat we have, every breath we have. He who loves us, the one we can always trust, the one who will always answer us truthfully through his word. And David inquired of God saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? The Lord said to him, Go up for I will deliver them into your hand. The Lord gave David's simple question a simple answer. This time, allowing David to work out the battle logistics with his captains and leaders of hundreds and leaders of thousands that we read about in chapter 12. Then verse 11 tells us how this major battle went. So they went up to Baal Perazim and David defeated them there. Then David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, they called the name of that place Baal Perazim. Now, we know the location of the Valley of Rephaim, but we see that David defeated the Philistines at Baal Perazim. So let's see if we can locate that. The actual location of Baal Perazim is not known, but most sources I find place it a few miles to the southwest of Jerusalem. I should point out that I think this map has the Valley of Rephaim in the wrong location. As we saw in the other one, it was, and I've, for most of the sources I find, it's southwest of Jerusalem, as it was shown in the previous map. So you can see from where Baal Perazim is, that's pretty close to the capital city when David engages this huge Philistine army. But there was no concern. 
because God said he, he would deliver the Philistines into David's hand. And because of the way in which God delivered the Philistines, David named the location Baal Perazim, which in Hebrew means master of breaches or possessor of breaches. Master of things breaching something. And he called it that because the Israeli army just blew through the Philistine army like water bursting through a dam. And he conquered them on the spot. Those who were left alive hightailed it out of there so fast and in such great fear that they left their pagan god statues on the battlefield. Well, it's no wonder why. These false gods of wood and stone provided no protection at all for the Philistines. But then we see David do something that set him and Israel apart from their neighboring nation. Verse 12 tells us this, And when they left their gods there, David gave a commandment, and they were burned with fire. If David had been a pagan king, he would have taken their gods back to the temple of his god and placed them inside, signifying the rulership, the domination of his god over these other gods. He would have done that because that was the pagan practice, which of course is based on a belief system and a god system created by men. So they made their gods think and act like they would think and act. You know, I dominated this, I'm going to show my dominance over it. Of course, their system has no basis in reality. The Bible is reality. And the Bible tells us that there is one God who created all and who is above all. And who is so holy that man himself cannot come into physical presence with God and live. So there is no way that David would think of taking these stone and wood gods and placing them anywhere in the tabernacle. Near the presence of the one true God. No, he does the proper thing and burns them on the spot. I mean, think about when the, um, when the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant. And they tried doing the pagan thing and putting it in the temple with their gods. Well, suddenly their gods flipped over on the ground. or Something else happened to them. Because <laughs> you can't do that when you're dealing with the holy God. But you know, the Philistines, I, I can identify with them in this respect here. Sometimes we don't learn things the first time. You notice that? I mean, it's not that we're stupid. We just don't see why we can't have things our way. So sometimes we go and we take another bite of the apple. This was the case with the Philistines. Let's read verses 13 through 17. Then the Philistines once again made a raid on the valley. Therefore David inquired again of God, and God said to him, You shall not go up after them circle around them and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear a sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall go out to battle, for God has gone out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. So David did as God commanded him and then drove back the army of the Philistines from Gibeon as far as Gezer. Then the fame of David went out into all lands and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations." Maybe the Philistines just thought that they hadn't given their best effort in the previous battle. In any case, they decide to return to the Valley of Rephaim and attack again. And although he had just won a great victory, as always, King David knew who actually won the battle, so he again consults Yahweh, seeking counsel on whether or not he should attack the Philistines. However, this time God does not advise him to make a head-on attack. Perhaps this is what the Philistines were anticipating. God tells David to circle around them, which would have Israel coming up on their rear ranks. And God even gives them the exact location this should take place. The King James and my new King James says, in front of the mulberry trees. The New American Standard and the English Standard Version say, the balsam trees. The Net Bible just says, the trees. The Hebrew word here is baka, which literally means weeping tree. It comes from a root word that means weeping. So this is thought to be a tree that weeps, you know, some type of sap, like a balsam tree or a mastic tree or a mulberry tree. Which actual tree it is, nobody knows. But even after they arrive in front of these trees, Israel is to wait until they hear a sound of marching in the tops of the trees. Now that sounds highly unusual, doesn't it? I mean... 
a sound of marching, you know, in the tops of the trees. I find some commentators who say that what is meant here is a rustling of the tr leaves of the tree. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, the sound of marching is not the same sound as trees rust tree leaves rustling. So I wondered where they got this view. Well, it may come from the Hebrew word itself. The Hebrew word here is se'ada. And it has two essential meanings. The first is to march or marching. And the second is it's an ornamental ankle chain. Also, it's used to mean the chain used by Oriental women to chain their ankles together, you know, not, not right up against each other, but closely together, forcing them to take small steps when they walked, which was considered more ladylike. Well, now, if we consider the sound of a chain rustling moving, I can see how some might take this word to mean a rustling of the leaves of the tree. And if the grove of trees was large enough, that rustling might cover the sound of David's men attacking the Philistines from the rear. So maybe this is part, partially a, a strategic thing. And as God told David in advance of the previous battle that he would deliver the Philistines into David's hand, here God tells David that he, God himself, will go out before David and his soldiers and will strike the camp of the Philistines. The result is that David and his men were obedient to God, and with God leading them, they drove the Philistine army from Gibeon all the way back to Gezer. So where are we talking about? Well, this map will give you an idea. I, well, okay, you can see the red lines. I didn't make them that thick because I didn't want to uh, conflict with the names of the places so you can see where they are. The battle was starting in the Valley of Rephaim, which is southwest of Jerusalem, where I've placed this red star. Then it appears to have been fought uh, to the north, up to the city of Gibeon. And then the Israelites drove the Philistines back west into their own territory to the city of Gezer. The military power that Israel exhibited in doing this was noticed by their surrounding neighboring nations. Because remember when we saw the first battle, that all the Philistines came on. Well, all the Philistines came on. So this is one huge group against another group. So Israel not only defeats them there and they return home, they defeat them up to the north and then they sweep them all over into their own territory again. This is noticed by their surrounding neighboring nations. And our Lord God made sure that they understood what had happened. So these nations developed a healthy fear of King David. And with that, would have gone a healthy fear of King David's God. And as David's son Solomon told us in the years following this event, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So these pagan nations were being given a path to a right relationship with God if they would only open their eyes to the truth. Today our Lord functions in a different way. His church is not a theocratic nation, and God does not deliver us from actual physical combat with our pagan neighbors. Well, I don't know. I don't know what you and your neighbors are like. Maybe I should just make that a blanket statement. But we must always remember, God today is the same God of the Old Testament. His power never diminishes. And one day there will be another physical battle in Israel when the armies of the world will gather together to wage war with our Lord Jesus Christ in the Valley of Armageddon. And if you think God going before David and his army here to destroy the Philistines was something, remember what we were told regarding the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation chapter 19, verse 21. And the rest were killed. This is after just talking about the, the beast and the, and the false prophet. And the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. The armies of the world will be gathered together to fight our Lord Jesus. And with one word from his mouth, the battle will be over. All of his enemies will lie dead at his feet. Hundreds of thousands dead with one word. 
the power of God is not diminished in any way. And as God directed and empowered David and his army, so too does he empower each one of us through his Holy Spirit to not only live a Christian life, but also to go forth and boldly proclaim the gospel message of salvation through his son Jesus. Let us always remember this as we continue these, to study these victories of David over the enemies of Israel. Let us pray. Dear Lord, the, when we think, if we study your word and we truly see these examples and think of your power, Lord, it becomes far more easier to understand the fear of the Lord. Because, Lord, having a healthy fear of you is much goes beyond just the thought of respect, Lord. Your power is so endless, and we see examples of it here with David. But when we contemplate the battle of Armageddon and how quickly that will be over, Lord, uh, Lord, it's, it's awe-inspiring. So, Lord, let us always remember your love for us and the power that you have and the power that you give us through your Holy Spirit, Lord, to stand in this world that is dying around us and to deliver your gospel of salvation, your gospel of truth, your gospel of eternal life, Lord. And, Lord, give us the the boldness to proclaim this to all that we can, Lord, because this world needs to hear it. And that's the job you have given us, Lord, as your children, as your disciples. So, Lord, we just thank you for this and thank you for your word. Show us every day how to bring you glory in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.